So some of you may remember the AI HAL from the movie 2001, which was made in the 60s. HAL was an AI and famously said to Dave, the human, that he refused to do something. And uh, this is a tipping point in the movie and concept of an AI developing free will and objecting to what a human is asking for and might want to do. And so there's been, for 50 years, essentially, there's been fear of AI doing something wrong. And the fears are not unfounded. And last month, a group recommended to pause development on AI because they're afraid that it's developing to be dangerous and they wanted to pause it six months, and which seems like a reasonable proposal. But the concept of whether or not everybody who's working on AI would stop work and every government would support this is a little bit unrealistic. And so the, this group has a number of very notable people, including Elon Musk and several important computer scientists who've been working on AI for a long time, as well as computer and science philosophers like Martin Rees or George Church. And I'm not sure they all entirely expected that when they signed up to be advisors to the Future of Life Institute that they would be recommending pausing AI, but here they, here they are. And so the, one of the problems with this is if it becomes government policy to outlaw AI, then of course uh, only outlaws would have AI. And that's also not very realistic. And so the, there's various problems with the way to express caution about AI that need to be held in balance, especially if we look at history, which we will a little bit. And so the, where is AI coming from? It's coming from, from humans, and it's a tool developed by humans, and the population of humans has been increasing a lot in, the, in an exponential way in the last 200 years. And it appears to be starting to stop or to become an S-curve, like most things in biology. And as, as, as recently as 10 years ago, people thought the, there was a population explosion that was not going to stop or slow down. And, and that was a catastrophic result for the Earth. But the, like most things in biology, they are exponential for a while, but then they flatten out. And especially in these recent 2,000 years, but in the last 200 years in particular, the Industrial Revolution and the development of tools that are becoming smarter and smarter, and AI is one of those tools. And the tools that humans invent co-evolve with humans. So just as humans are evolving and inventing tools and improving them, the tools themselves are evolving almost independently and this is improving on an exponential basis, the capabilities of the tools. And so in the case of computers, uh, Ray Kurzweil has noticed that the price performance of computation has been increasing in an exponential way. So this is a logarithmic graph where the, the Y scale is on a logarithmic scale, meaning doubling or a 10x scale. And so this curve would be similar to the human population if it were on a linear scale, but it, here it's exponential. And it's not just recently that this has been happening, it's been happening for a long time. And uh, here from Steve Jervison is the different computers that have been also on a logarithmic scale. And the performance of the computers over the last 120 years, and the computers are steadily increasing in performance across wars, across recessions, across mechanism types, like modern computers are integrated circuits, transistors, but before they were vacuum tubes and relays and even punch cards and mechanical computers. And this improvement curve is, continues to, uh, to advance regardless of what humans are doing. So if there's a recession or a war, it doesn't slow down the improvement of the technology. And in AI in particular, the large language models like ChatGTP, which is in the news these days, are getting improving in terms of scale, also in a, almost a super exponential, because this is an exponential graph, but you'll notice it's not a straight line, it's curving upward also. 
And so the scale of the large language model data sets that are being processed by the computers is going up extremely fast, doubling every few months, really, instead of every year or two. And so this is consuming a lot of energy and increasing the power of the AIs to process effectively all human language and therefore human knowledge. And so this is useful, but it also creates fear that what's going to happen if this continues on. And so the fears are arising around what AI is going to do for humanity. And there's obvious benefits, but it also can cause harm. And, uh, and so this is popular in the news uh, recently as well. And one of the fears as it manifests with the evolution of humans is that AIs become increasingly powerful as a tool, becoming more powerful than humans. And the fear is basically that AIs would enslave humans and take over life on this planet. And obviously people are afraid of that, not without reason. But this is the crux of the fear of the advancing technology. And so the catastrophizing and fear has is, is been a human thing to do for a long time. And I'll go through a few examples. So the, many religions have a concept of the end of times or the end of days or the apocalypse or the rapture or... <laughs> So if you notice in most cities, the good people are lifted up into the sky, but in Las Vegas, there's only one. Uh, and, and so there's other kinds of catastrophes that are real. Asteroids that wiped out the dinosaurs do happen on a recurring basis. And, and it's not until recently that anybody knew why or how these happen or that they might be preventable. And if the dinosaurs had been fearful of this, they would have done something about it, but they didn't. And, and therefore they had their own end of times. There's other long scale trends, like the fears around the climate changing. Of course, climates change on all planets and it's changing here. And whether that's caused by nature or by humans, it's still something that will affect life on this planet. And with good reason then to be wary about it and prepare for it. And technologies, human tools, have been the subject of fear campaigns for hundreds of years. An example that some people have heard of are called the Luddites, which are the people who in the 19th century were afraid that the machines that wove fabrics would take away the jobs of humans. And so there was a movement to destroy the machines before they, they did that. And obviously there wouldn't be fast fashion and other things of that nature if the machines had been destroyed by that movement. When electricity was first being deployed in cities, people were afraid of it because it could kill you if you touch the wires the wrong way. And there were actually movements to, to pause or stop electricity because it was a danger to society. And elevators needed a human operator before they became self-driving, fully autonomous. And there was a fear that if you got in the elevator without a human driver, you would come to a bad end. And so it took a long time before people got trusting enough in the autonomous capabilities of elevators that, that they would ride them without an operator. Cars, the same when cars or horseless carriages were first introduced, laws were passed in some countries that the car was not allowed to go faster than a running human who was required by law to run in front of the car and the car couldn't go faster than that and the human had to carry a red flag to warn the pedestrians that a car was coming. And, uh, and so these kind of fear, fears seem, and regulations seem crazy now, but th this is real. <laughs> and in modern times, there are some parts of society that reject the technology at a certain stage. And so the Amish are an example who reject technology more or less after the 19th century and want to live with, without it to a large extent. And, and so it's like a speciation and human culture where 
some of the people adopt or embrace the new technologies and others are con conservative of the old ways and resist the new technology and try and live without them feeling life was better then. In, in the 80s and 90s, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, who was a math professor at Berkeley, who has a very exotic history, the, he had a fear that the development of technologies, especially computers and high-tech things, would end humanity. And his thought-out theory was written out in the Unabomber Manifesto. And, and before that was published, which wouldn't have been easy to publish it if he hadn't done what he did, he would send anonymous mail bombs to scientists working in universities and at corporations to basically blow them up in their offices and kill them because they were working on biotech or they were working on computer science or they were working on something that he considered high tech that was leading to the end of humanity. So he wanted to scare people working on new technologies away from doing that. And he wrote a manifesto, the Unabomber Manifesto, that eventually the New York Times agreed to publish the whole thing in the newspaper so everybody could read about his well-considered, thought-out fears about how technology is going to end humanity. And he might be right, but his approach wasn't received. <laughs> In, in 2000, Bill Joy, who was the chief scientist of Sun Microsystems, who developed Java and other important things, he wrote an article called, about what he called gray goo, which is nanotechnologies that were out of our control, which are microscopic robots that would turn into a gray goo that would take over humanity and, and end humanity. And, and his point was these things can independently evolve the technologies into something that might end humanity. And these are also possibilities. So recently, Eliezer Yudowski is a computer scientist, kind of philosopher theorist who works for an organization called MIRI, which is the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is a nonprofit that stokes the fears about AI and how AI is dangerous and how, to, how it might kill us all and how to be careful about that. And the Miri Institute is related to the Future of Life Institute. And so there's a whole camp, like a religious movement, that is the conservative fear approach to technology and AI. And they're well-funded and organized, I include Elon Musk, who's on the one side warning everybody about the dangers of AI, while at the same time pursuing it aggressively in a capitalist way. And so one of the fears about AI is taking away people's jobs, and whether that's writers or artists or accountants or lawyers. And the, the thing is, even today, millions of people every day, their job daily is to carry water. And so they walk from their village down to the source of water and carry it in a bucket. And, and that's their work. That's their career or job. And, and so it, if you gave these people plumbing, it would take away their job. And few people would say plumbing is bad and so forth. But these are the kind of fears of the old way being replaced by a newer, better way. And so people approach it either saying, great, let's put in plumbing, or no, let's destroy the plumbing and have everybody carry water and chop wood and carry water kind of way. And so one of the things, if the labor type jobs or the monthly hourly income type jobs are replaced by AIs and computers, the question is what will people do? And tied in with the discussion about AI is that the, in, to have the concept of universal basic income, which is the nanny state government gives the monthly income to everybody for free. And the fear of that is that if people got free money, they would become alcoholics and addicts and wouldn't be productive. And so the concept of, of how will people live when a lot of the basic needs are done by plumbing or technology is a reasonable fear. And so the solution to that fear is that the government pays them, basically.
And so some of these fears are well-founded, like the Titanic or the Hindenburg. Is there new technologies at the time? And, and the technical optimists said, what could go wrong with the Titanic and, or the Hindenburg? And obviously bad things happen. So it's not unreasonable to be cautious about new technologies, but it doesn't mean that they should be banned either. And so with AI, there's one of the dangers is weaponized AIs, where if you add weapons or the ability to kill humans or other AIs to an AI, just by basic game theory, the strategy, the only surviving strategy is to shoot first to kill. Don't even ask questions. And so the problem is that once you automate an intelligence with weapons, some of them will reasonably rash, ration, rationalize that, well, the only way to survive is to shoot first to kill, because otherwise somebody playing that strategy will kill you. And so it becomes a very hair trigger dangerous thing if once you set it free. And what these think, this is a transformational time for society and and ChatGTP, the T stands for transformation, which is a kind of metamorphosis of changing something from the old way into a new way. And an example of that from nature is, for example, a caterpillar metamorphizing into a butterfly. And most people like caterpillars, and I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with them. But the, it, once it changes into a butterfly, it's more beautiful and it can fly. And so this transition is something that may be happening to life, uh, carbon-based life, where we're in a metamorphosis or transformation from, from one form into another form. It doesn't mean caterpillars will go away, but it does mean that something else is evolving that has capabilities that, that we don't. And so just as caterpillars turn into butterflies, life can turn from carbon-based to electronic and have capabilities like traveling at the speed of light that humans can't do now. And so from a practical point of view, books are something that are honored as the keepers of all knowledge of humans. And it's a 500 year old technology that maybe isn't the best way to communicate ideas. And what a book is ultimately is it's an idea and the idea can be packaged in dead trees and put in physical stores, or it can be an idea that's expressed not just in Wikipedia, but as an AI on the internet where the current form that the people like are called chatbots. And even the founders of Google back around 2000 said that the future of search is to have a conversation with somebody you trust. And so if you are searching for ideas to be able to have a conversation with, the, with someone you trust in a language and a format that works for you, that the ideas in a book or in many books can be hosted in an AI and you can have the AI read you the book cover to cover or you can ask it questions about what's in the book or could you summarize this book before you take nine hours of my time to, to explain it to me. And so that's just a better format to express and deliver ideas in and it can be personalized to five-year-olds in Uganda or academics in Oxford or whatever format the receiver wants. And the questions can be organized how the receiver wants the information to, to come in. And so the, it's not obvious now, but AIs are a very good replacement or transformation of books or ideas in general. And just as you can transform from one biological form to another, like the caterpillar to butterfly, you can also transform information, which is ideas, from atoms into bits. And, and this may be evolving going on where information in biology has been stored in, as atoms in DNA and chemistry and so forth. And increasingly, like what defines a person is more information stored in their phone 
and less importantly, what is their biochemistry? And so we may be in a transformation of going from atoms to bits. And basically, AI is your friend, and you should embrace it. So that this is intended to be a bit provocative to stimulate arguments or questions or thoughts. Thanks, Chris. That was so interesting and wonderful. The thing that came to mind, two things came to mind. One was, and I think this is a question that you have that you could have of any technology, but if we have so many people who don't have plumbing, and then we have this tiny percentage of people who have like lethal AI, shouldn't we distribute the technology a little more so that everyone comes up a little higher as opposed to it being such a weirdly broad spectrum? So and, go ahead. Yeah, th this is a communist concept. And, uh, but the <laughs> you call me a communist. <laughs> But most technologies, when they're first developed, are accessible mostly to the wealthy and the privileged. And it, it takes time to, to refine the manufacturing process so that they can be made cheaply and in, in quantity. And like phones, as an example, were something that was accessible to governments and then wealthy people. And then eventually they become accessible to everybody. And that takes time. So it, it, it's not intentional that the things aren't distributed evenly. It's more a, a matter of like refinement of does this work? What's the form that works the best? And then how to make that as accessible as possible. And so it, it's true that it's not economically evenly distributed at the beginning. But then again, it might be dangerous and it might not work. And so you don't necessarily want to give it give a car to everybody with no seatbelts. Thank you. And then the other thing that struck me, which is less of a question and more just an observation, is that when you were speaking about the books and how you can have someone explain a book to you, and I was just thinking, oh, like, why do I read books? And the thing that struck me was, if you can do everything so easily now, then it really has you wonder what is the point of what I'm doing? Like, why am I doing this? Is it just to make money? Why, why do, you know, if ChatGBT can do it, what is the it that, it's, that I'm doing it for? This is the purpose of life question. Why is there life at all? And then what's my role in life? And, the, and that people are not standalone individuals. Like people were, People are part of a colony, they're like a beehive, and the individual bee has its own experience, but it's part of a beehive, and it wouldn't survive without the beehive. And so humans in society are just the same way, and that a human wouldn't survive very long, and they certainly wouldn't breed if they were all alone. And so it's something that we're part of a, of a larger system, of a larger organism, of a species and of a culture within that species. And that, so our role is to participate as a good citizen of that community. And the, and the people who diverge from that get in trouble and the community will reject them. So put them in prison or kill them. And so the main force of the purpose of life is being part of as opposed to an adversary of. And so the, and then this is true of, of deer and wolves and bees and termites and so forth. And so the, our consciousness develops an ego as we reach puberty and then it keeps that ego until our sort of breeding time is done. But as a child or elderly, the, it's more important to be part of than separate from. And so, the, so being part of is being connected to and cooperating with the other members of our tribe or society. And, and so some of these tools are designed to facilitate that cooperation, like 
like taming fire to do cooking, allowed people to stay warm and pre-digest their food, which allowed different choices of food that, and so some of the people were hunting the, the prey and others were gathering the sticks to make the fire and then they would get back together and cook it and consume it. And, and there's an interesting concept that, you know, without refrigeration, it, when you kill an animal to eat the animal meat, humans can't really do that without fire to cook it because they can't digest raw meat very easily. And, the, and without storage or refrigeration, the safest place to keep fresh food is in the bellies of your, your tribe. That it, it's, and so there's more food than one individual can eat. And if you cook it and they can digest it, then the, the most efficient place for that cooked food is in the people that might be your friends or might be your distant relatives and not in a refrigerator in a vault. And so the purpose of life is to be part of that community. And laws are constructed to keep people in or out, depending on their cooperation. If that, does that answer that question? No, but it was great. <laughs> <laughs> you no, I don't think that was a question to answer. It was just, that was fun. What is the meaning of life? But, yeah, has it, does well, ChatGBT well, have an idea? Douglas Adams designed a computer that figured that out and yeah, well, came to the answer. Of, 42. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And 42 is, two is binary, like bits, and four is the four bases of DNA, so it's, DNA and wow. binary. That was a very fun talk. And I was curious, what do you think AI will open up for us as a society, like in the two decade time period? Freedom and, and access to knowledge. And like plumbing, it'll make things easier. Thanks. We have a question online. Capil isn't able to talk, but he would love to hear your views, Reese, on where you see AI developing in the short, medium, and long term. I think so. AI has been in development for for fifty years, and the early parts of AI were really digesting the past and what the future direction is for AI to take what it learned about the past and apply it to the future. And so the previous talk we did about AI talks about that in particular. And so the, by digesting the past in ways that can be understood beyond human capabilities allows the AI to predict more accurately what's likely to happen in the future. And so connecting the past to the future is what these sort of state-of-the-art generative AI tools, as they're calling them, like ChatGTP, is basically learning from the past, building a model of the past from pattern recognition, and then using that to anticipate the future. And so Google's been generative AI for a decade with their, for example, type ahead feature where when you start to ask a question of Google, it guesses what your likely next words are gonna be and, and puts them in for you as a suggestion. And, and the newer generative AIs just put in more. If you're asking that question, you're probably writing an essay for your class and the class is about such and such. And so there I can predict the whole paper you're gonna need to write. And the ones coming soon is once you have a paper, you might want to turn that into a book. And once you have a book, you might want to have a class and a Hollywood movie and a prequel and a sequel. <laughs> and the AI can, based on past requests and how other people have gone down the same path of questioning, can anticipate what you want and give it to you. And so this is AI dealing with just purely information and concepts and where, so that's basically past predicting the future, which in writing is called fiction. 
And so fiction hasn't really been tested against reality. And so what science does is it tests the prediction of the fiction against results. And so it writes something about the future and then it can be tested against what actually happens in the future and, the, and that can refine the model and make it better. And where it becomes even more interesting is you can have a chat DTP predict what the future is for lunch, for example, but then you can attach that to robots who will go and collect the food and cook it and prepare it and serve it. And so it's where you start to go from fiction to, to, to evidence-based fact and get more accurate. And then you act, activate that with a robot that is taking the forecast and actually doing it and implementing it. And so those are characteristics that are very useful for humans. It saves time and effort and so forth. and makes the future more comfortable. But it's also describing more or less what life does. And single cell organisms, they learn and they move and they have predators and prey and so on. And, uh, and so if these information capabilities of learning, processing, predicting, acting are implemented, that, that's more or less describing life. And so it's the early stages of AIs as the brain part of robots becoming alive. And, uh, and AIs being alive it is a risk or a threat because it's another life form competing for resources in the ecosystem. And it's either going to be a predator or it's going to be prey relative to humans. And so people are afraid of things that might be predators and they're attracted to things that might be prey. And so it's, but it's another life form evolving. And in some ways it's going to be better than people. And just as horses are stronger than people and dogs are more friendly, and that just because it's a different life form doesn't mean it's better or worse in all dimensions. It's just another one in an ecosystem. And, uh, and that, that's where the trend is going. He had a question. I yeah, this may be tied to kind of like what you're talking about, like a life form and creating, but as it is right now, you put in information, it does a bunch of grinding, crunching, and then it pops out some kind of answer. And then there's this black box nature of all that hardcore computations happening on the inside. And I think that right now, the best is that you want, once an answer comes out, you then say, why did you give it that answer? It didn't have a ready answer. It goes back and crunches and then it pops up something that it thinks you might want to hear. That's what I'm like, do you have thoughts on like how that black box can then be then demystified in some way? Or do we just say, that's how people work. This yeah. is another person. So that's the best answer because <laughs> that is how people work in that most people, if you ask them, why do you want that? They don't know, but they know you want to know. So they'll make up an answer. And the AIs are the same, that the, like, how do you know that? And why are you asking that? It, as I was raised as a kid, I, like anything I would say, they, they would prompt me, how do you know that? Or, or why are you asking that? And so if you're prompted to be prepared to answer those questions, you think more carefully about anything you ask your parents. But this is something that we're creating and people are trying to troubleshoot, like how do we get an answer? So doesn't there, isn't there some form of need of being able to like dissect it or do we need to just develop a whole, do we need like computer psychologists to treat our AI? Yeah, that, that's a reduction of scientific view that we need to know how the mechanism of everything to understand what it is. But there's most things that we don't really know what the mechanism is. And, uh, and we're, we maybe know it at some characteristic level, but we don't know all the way down, all the turtles down. And so it's more the, if we're asking, how did you choose which airline ticket to buy? To the AI, it'll say, because it was the best one. <laughs> and then you can say, what does that mean? And it could say, what's the price or the schedule or something. But the, how the airline works, it doesn't need to know that. And so it's, but from a science engineering point of view, we like reductionism is a religion. 
that it's really important to know the fundamental mechanisms of things, which the deeper you go, the kind of less precise, and you may know how the orbital states of an electron are around a particular nucleus of a particular atom, but of the trillion atoms that are there, you don't really know all of them. And so it's, and then in, in a religion, you would say, well, that was God's will. And they're equally valid answers. And the religion is saying, the mechanism is not that important. And the scientist is saying, well, it's very important. And from a human point of view, it's somewhere in between. And that's why two thirds of the world ascribes to some religion or another. And, and then the one thirds that are dedicated to science, they get confused in the mystery. Heavy. <laughs> Hi, Reese. This was really fun, and I liked all of your slides. And I, my question is, so AI, because you said, like, at some point, AI will be better than humans, be like, smarter. Or, but when I think of AI, I think of it as, like, it's pulling information from the past, from history, from what us as humans have created. And so in a way, they're regurgitating the past history of humans. And then my, well, my, I have a few thoughts, but one, isn't that just repeating the past while the world is evolving. And then if humans don't, if the humans, if we offload our jobs or our training and we have a thousand dollars a month and we stop creating, don't we stop evolving in a certain way? Then the, and then the AI, doesn't AI and humans have to work in conjunction for AI to still be relevant? Otherwise, cause AI needs a pool of information that's newer I think, yeah. to stay relevant. But if humans have all the jobs go to robots, then there's like a lack of updating and there's a lack of new, maybe a lack of, maybe not a lack of news, but like a lack of like human heart, which interprets the world in like shifting ways that's more connected to nature maybe. And so how does that relationship work and how does AI stay relevant if it's just regurgitating and the, can humans stay trained and open and educated if we're off-gassing our jobs. AI can learn and, the, and adapt. And the, so the information about the past it is useful and the predictions you make from it are useful until they're inaccurate. And so the part about attaching AI to robots and to the experimenting with the future moves it from the realm of doing it based purely on the past to iterative improvement. And so in that, it's like natural selection and evolution is that you try a few different variations and see which one survives. And so the, it'll make mistakes that'll go extinct and it'll do something that isn't perfect, that it'll make more variations. And so it's an evolving thing. But the, like the present, the Ram Das be here now concept of what matters is the present moment and not the past and not the future. And the past is subjective. It's what information you have. And so most of the information that current generative AIs have right now is what humans have talked about before, because that's what it's learning from. So that is the past as far as the corpus of all human language and knowledge so far, which is kind of what it has to go on. But once it can start doing experiments mm. and saying, is this concept better than that concept? It can refine it independently of humans or of the human past. So it, but the humans don't necessarily need to, to do all of the things down, like a garden, how the zucchini grows. Uh, understanding that better is not necessarily important. It, it's just that it can happen. And so it, is that kind of good? I think so. I think I'm hearing what you're saying. It's like there's space for both like human flourishing and AI to do some jobs for us. Yeah, yeah. AI could do all the jobs eventually. Mm -hmm. But then are humans, are they obligated to work on carrying water? This is a great question. Yeah. And so in, in some sense, you could look at it like a neoteny evolution reversion back to childhood, 
where right now when we're children, we don't pay for our food, we don't clean up very well, we don't, like our parents take care of us. And so why would it be bad if the AIs just took care of us and we would be like cats or dogs and, uh, and like, <laughs> like the cat doesn't really care how the food got in the can. But our we have a different consciousness than a cat. There's like an idle mind is the devil's playground or whatever, or yeah, idle yeah, hands. Well, totally, but yeah. th this is in the realm of mysticism and this might be good. Like the free religion is the freedom to explore these uncertainties and feel comfortable in them. And so the, so the thing is, the conscious, our consciousness isn't necessarily the ultimate consciousness that the AIs and the internet can be much more conscious of all the things going on in the world than we are. And that doesn't make us inferior, it just makes us different. Do you think that AI could develop a heart, personalities, feelings, emotions, yeah, all yeah. of that? So AI doesn't have a body, or if it did, it wouldn't be the same as a human body. And so the so it's this concept of theory of mind. We're very important in human being part of the tribe and part of the community is to have a theory of mind of what do the other people think I'm thinking. And for me to know what you're thinking, I have to have a theory of how you think about things and even how you think this other person is thinking about things. And, and that's, that's, humans are good at that. And humans, for example, it, are have a second order theory of mind where like like I I can think about what you're thinking about this other person where some animals some primates and crows for example can do this but the an AI could do it much better and an AI can has more memory and has more processing power coming soon and that can be superior to humans about things like that but for example, if I see you get injured, for example, it triggers the part of my brain of what would that feel like? And that my body actually feels the injury that you're experiencing through this limbic resonance theory of mind type of connection. And so an AI could learn about that and know if you stub your toe, you'll feel bad but they don't feel it viscerally in the mind-body kind of way that a person does. And so if I watch you stubbing your toe, my toe will hurt. And it's part of my body, and an AI doesn't have that body. And so it, it can't really feel it in the same visceral way that we do, but it can learn to say, oh, when you do that, you say these things. And so there are nuances in terms of the mind-body connection and the interpersonal limbic resonance of that that uh, AIs are not good at. And so the ultimate Turing test of uh, the Turing test is where an AI tricks a person into thinking it's another person. The acid test of that is, is how much empathy and, and limbic connection and mind-body kind of resonance is there so AIs will probably not be very good at kissing, for example, or other kind of sex-related things. Thanks, Therese. Okay.